Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Satan here he's gonna quote for he's gonna quote scripture now. He's gonna quote Psalm ninety one eleven. Says he shall give his angels charge over you, and in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Satan has questioned God's protection here. Uh, he's, he's questioned his provision in the last one. He's basically saying, will he protect you? If so, prove it. Prove it to me. Prove it to this nation, Jesus. Israel wants to see who you are. Show us. Psalm 91 says he will protect you with his angels, but... Satan leaves out something. He always, he, he always leaves those little things out. It says, there, it says at the end of that, he says, he will lead you in all his ways. That's God's ways. Satan may quote scripture, or may quote scripture to you. Like I said, he'll often leave a phrase or two out of the process. The promise is he will keep you in all of his ways. That's the promise. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. The Father will protect me and he will guide me, but I will not put him to the test. And that's what you're asking me to do, to satisfy your curiosity or for those who are observing me. Scripture says, Satan, uh, what do you call it, that, that you are not to put the Lord your God to the test. You don't test him. It's like uh, snake handling. You know, some of the churches that do the snake handling. You know, these poisonous snakes, and these people are always continually getting bitten by the snakes. They're, they're putting God to the test. Don't test him. When you read that in context, who's it for? For missionaries. You know, it's like us going to Japan and being in the, a radioactive zone. You know, God will provide His protection. It's like going, going out here and saying, well, you know what, I think I'm going to sit out on the freeway. And I'm going to see, I'm, God's going to show me His protection. As the semi truck drives over you, <laughs> probably won't happen. <laughs> Don't put the Lord to the test. All right. So we see the Father's provision, and now we see the in the Father's protection. Lastly, we see the Father's promise. Again, the devil took him up on the on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. See, the Father had promised all things to his Son. But Satan is coming and telling him that the world was his. See, in the garden when Adam sinned, he turned over the title deed to the earth. God gave man the dominion to rule over the earth. But, but man handed all of that over to Satan when he sinned in the garden. Satan had that right to offer Jesus this. And he tells him that I'll give it to you right now. You don't have to go through all the things that you're going to be going to. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to be crucified. You don't need to be beaten. You don't need to descend into the depths of hell. Here's a shortcut, Jesus. Just fall down here and worship me. <coughs> the promise of the Father, you see, Jesus knows will be fulfilled. It will be fulfilled. And, and, and the enemy is asking him, do you really believe that, Jesus? Do you really believe it's going to be fulfilled? Do you think it will ever be fulfilled? And Satan then tells him, you know, 
bow down and worship me and I'll let you have it now. You know, those of you who are single, will God ever give you that right person? The enemy will come to you and say, well, let me give them to you now. You know, they may not be going to church. But look, you're a believer. You'll influence them. You know, Satan will put in doubt the Father's promise. Jesus was, was really tempted by all of these things. Are you sure that, you know, are you sure that that voice that you heard was really true, Jesus? Yeah, why are you hungry? The Father's provision. Jump, Jesus. Or do you doubt the Father's protection? Don't wait on the Father's promise. You can have it all now. See, these temptations are going to come your way. I would probably bet that everybody in here has experienced these temptations. You know, these three these three ways will come at you again and again and again. Opportunity often comes only once, but temptation, it seems, loves to keep knocking at the door constantly, doesn't it? Every temptation will come in these three categories: in provision, protection, and promise. But Jesus overcame the temptation. How? Quoted scripture. See, again, when the enemy attacks, we can quote scripture. You know, we are capable of doing that. We can do the same thing that Jesus did. Read the book of Deuteronomy. This is where Jesus quotes from. The title means. What does the title of Deuteronomy mean? Does anyone know that? Hmm? Huh? Yeah, remember. Because it's a retelling of the law. Remember. Notice both Jesus and Satan quote Scripture. But the difference is that Jesus is doing what? He is submitted to it. Uh, I don't live by bread alone. Uh, I choose to follow the Word and not material things. Uh, I, I, I don't live by bread alone. I don't, I'm not going to follow the things of this world. So you can quote Scripture all you want, but the question is, is are you submitted to it? Uh, you know, you got to ask yourself, you know, am I submitted to, that, to the Scripture that I am quoting? Jesus here, you know, this is what I'm going, this is what I'm doing. I will worship him and him alone. I will worship the Father and him alone. You know, don't just be a quoter of the word. Being a quoter of the word, that doesn't scare Satan. But when you're a doer of the word, that terrifies the enemy. See, that's the power of the word. Not just being a quoter of the word but being submitted to it. You know, this was probably where Jesus was doing His devotions that day. He was probably going through the book of Deuteronomy. Because the quotes that He gives are from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and chapter 8. Satan is telling, is telling you, uh, Satan won't tell you when He's coming. You ever notice that? These, these things didn't come up. You know, He didn't tell the people of Japan, hey, Earthquake tsunami today. It just came. Uh, he's going to hit you when you're at your weakest. Be in the Word. It says, And the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And now when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. Jesus now goes into the northern, re northern region, a very populated area. About 204 villages residing, residing there. Over 15,000 people or more at that time. This was called the region, the region of death by those in the south. Because the Gentiles were constantly taking this area in history, uh, in, in the history of Israel. 
the Syrians would come in. All types of Gentile influences. And often the people in this region, they considered half-breeds. And leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea. This is a pretty, uh, real beautiful beach town in the region. It says, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. This darkened area uh, that the rest of Israel didn't, they didn't want much part of it. This is where Jesus goes, and this is where he sets up his headquarters. Jesus likes to go to the places uh, of the people who are being most attacked. The ones that are feeling most out of it. Yeah, this is where Jesus likes to go. Uh, in the midst of sinners. Uh, the cool Jews, they went to Jerusalem. But not Jesus. I'll go to the place where it's dark and the people are looked down upon. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Says the kingdom is at hand. Uh, the, kingdom of, uh, the kingdom of heaven means the rule of God or the reign of God. Uh, Matthew will use it 32 times in his gospel. Why is this in, in Matthew's? Why, why is it that Matthew is the only one that uses this phrase? Uh, as Mark, Luke, and John, they'll use the kingdom of God. Uh, the reason is because the Jews were looking for a literal, physical, material-based kingdom in the nation of Israel. Uh, Matthew is telling the Jews, he's saying the kingdom of heaven is a way bigger place way bigger than Israel way bigger than you it is a spiritual kingdom larger than you can imagine Jesus walking by the sea of Galilee saw two brothers Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen then he said to them follow me and I will make you fishers of men they immediately left their nets and followed him Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. In the boat was Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The calling of Peter and Andrew, James and John, uh, they had met him previously, as we know, in John's gospel. But now Jesus is calling them into ministry. He doesn't say, follow me, and we'll take a course in evangelism. Uh, let's go to this seminar. No, he says, come and hang out with me. And you'll become more like me. And in it, you'll become a fisher of men. You don't need all these other things, just follow me. And you'll hang out with me, and I'll make you a fisher of men. It's possible that seven of the disciples were fishermen. Notice here what Peter is doing when, he's, when the Lord calls him. Uh, he's casting his net into the sea. Why? Because he was an evangelist. It was Peter on the day of Pentecost that was preaching, and 3,000 were saved. See, Peter was a bold one. John was the apostle of love. He helped mend people. What's he doing here? He's mending nets. Their ministry was seen here in what they were already doing. Holy Spirit already seeing what these guys were doing, and he used them in that way. Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Check out the order here. First the teaching, then preaching, then healing. 
teaching, laying the principles and precepts, preaching, stimulating, and proclaiming. Then comes the healing, the manifesting, the outworking. Uh, and this is why I think a lot of healing ministries you see, uh, they're a mess. Why? Because they don't do things in the correct order. First teaching, then preaching, and then healing. Not reverse order. Yeah, you need to be committed to the study of the Word. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were affected with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. He taught them, and he preached to them, and to those that were hurting, he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee, from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Over 100 miles, the people would come and walk to see him. <clears throat> Did you have to go a long way to go to church? Uh, they, would come, they would come so far to hear him teach, to hear his preaching, and to receive his healings. And I want you guys to remember this as we go into next week. Uh, this is the height of Jesus' popularity. So remember that as we start next week. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for you. And, uh, Lord, Lord, I just pray if there's anyone here today who doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that you would work on their hearts now. And, uh, Lord Jesus, uh, they, would, uh, they would want to be born again. They would want to know what it means to have their slate clean and your life living in them. Uh, Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, if there is anyone here today who doesn't know you, Jesus, uh, that they would come to know you today. And Lord, if there's someone here today who isn't who knows you but they're not walking with you, Lord, I pray too, Lord, that they would re, uh, rededicate their life to you. Lord, they would want to just continue on that walk with you. Uh, Lord, you are amazing. And Lord, we thank you that we do have you, Jesus, as our high priest. That you have been tempted in every way we have, but you were without sin. Lord, we thank you that we can depend upon you. And that you will always come through for us. Lord, when everybody else has left us, you'll be there. You'll be there right there beside us. We thank you that you are so faithful. Lord, we thank you that you don't take the easy way out of things. Lord, that should mean so much, so much more to us that you took the hard road. Lord, you gave everything for us. We thank you for you, Jesus, and we give you praise in your name. Amen.